this Ask GMB and you guys have been super busy in the comments down below sending us emails to ask at gmbn.com as well with questions for us to answer and I'm here today to answer them questions <laughs> and I'm gonna kick it off with a really good one it's from Jack Beams it says I love the channel thank you very much but I've I've sent my bike into the bike well this is a pretty good question actually I get asked this question a lot when I bump into some fellow fans of the show says I want my bike in the bike vault he sent it in 10 times over the course of the year and he hasn't been shown in the bike vault well Jack tomorrow's your lucky day watch tomorrow's dirt shed show you'll be in the dirt shed um, you'll be in the bike vault there you go you're in hopefully you get it super nice uh, next question Matthew 213 213 says if I may ask, you may ask, what is the difference between a 360 down whip and a decade? Ha! <laughs> right, if you don't know what these things are, they're two tricks, two different tricks. So I'm gonna answer this question. The 360 down whip, basically you're doing a 360. Your body's doing a 360, but you're kicking the bike as well away from you. So you're meeting the bike halfway around, then you're continuing the 360 and land your trick. The decade, well, your bike needs to stay straight you got to do a 360 around in front of the bike all the way around and get back on your bike and land it all these tricks are done on an air i can do the 360 down whip decade no it's pretty hard <laughs> i need to learn that trick but that's another day so hopefully that's answered your question bike goes one way you catch it halfway you land a decade you go around instead of your bike moving your bike's got to stay straight you move around get back on your bike land it good question though Diego Albello is sending a question. I'm a roadie. <laughs> this is GMBN, dude, not GCN. But he's got a pretty good question. He says, I'm getting into mountain biking. That's a good thing. That's a good start. Should I use my road bike position on my mountain bike? Hell no. Because that's a recipe for disaster. You don't want to have your elbows in. You don't want to be shrunk down. You don't want to have your knees bent into your bike. You want to adopt the attack position I like to call it. So you want to have your elbows bent, you want to have your elbows out, you want to be looking ahead, you want to have your knees slightly bent, you want to keep your body weight quite central to the bike. But that all depends on the terrain you're riding. If you're descending, you want to move your body weight backwards. If you're going up a hill, quite a steep one, you want to move your weight up the front, just get above it, get up that climb. Mountain biking is all about moving around your bike, super aggressive. With a road bike, you got your, you know, you got your elbows in, your knees are in, you bent your bike, your back, you're looking ahead, you're just pedaling away, you lean into the turns. You don't want to do that on a mountain bike. You just want to be super aggressive. You just want to move your bike around. You want to move your body around that bike when you're out there on the trail. Right, Diego. The only time a roadie position looks cool is when you ride it like this. Right, that's a pretty cool video and I, to be honest, I was there behind the scenes building some of those obstacles. Pretty proud of it, pretty proud of Mr. Ashton as well. Next question, Finn2214. How big should I build a step up for learning backflips, 360s and other tricks? And also, how many tons of dirt would I need to build a set of decent sized dirt jumps? Hashtag AskGMBN at the end. So, well, it all depends. The perfect setup for step up size for learning backflips is you want to build quite a big step up. You don't really want to be building a small jump to learn the backflip because you want some time to go upside down and come back. You want to think when you're doing it. You don't just want to go right and then land it because it's not how you're going to learn to do the perfect, nice, comfortable backflip. So four foot lip, that's how high you should build a lip. That's the smallest you can go. And then you're stepping up to about five foot, maybe five and a half is a perfect size step up. But building a jump that big does take a lot of dirt. Tonnage, I actually don't know how many tons. I just shift dirt till I know what size it is. And if it takes a while to get the perfect step up, that's fine, because you're gonna have the perfect step up. When it comes to dirt jumps, whew, that takes some time. So you wanna build three of these jumps in a row. So you want a four foot with a five foot lip, 
or you know with a five foot lip with a six foot landing uh, likewise you want to start off small and work yourself up to a bigger size it's a lot of dirt and it takes time but you gotta be super comfortable with jumping when you want to learn backflips because backflips are pretty scary I would say it's a pretty easy trick to do, it's just in your head because you're going upside down over a gap, but you want to make sure you're super comfortable with jumping, you know your skills, you know your abilities, and you're confident with going upside down. You've learned this trick in a safer environment, like a, like a foam pin. That's where I learned to, to do a backflip, is in a foam pin. Then I took it to the hard surface, and then I took it to a dirt jump, but it took me a, quite a few goes and a few crashes to get it, but it was, it's all about being safe. Can't stress that enough. But happy practicing. Right, for you beginners that wanna be at that level of jumping, then take a look at this video. It'll help you out build a beginner dirt jump. Okay, so you've got the rough shape. Now it's to carve that little sand castle jump out of that dirt you've just stuck there. So best way of doing it is walking down the landing, making it not so steep because you want to land on it. You want to land in another takeoff. So walk down, make it a little bit hard, make the dirt compact, push the dirt down. Another question you've been asking whilst watching this video is how tall are you supposed to make this jump? Well, for this one, in proportion of the size of the jump, I recommend two foot is the pretty much optimum height to build it. If you're gonna go bigger, you wanna get more higher, so you're gonna build it taller. All my little humans say, Yay! you're not little, you're massive. That's a pretty rad video, it's gonna help you build your jumping skills, plus help you build a jump as well, and get you off the ground. Right, next question coming in from Quang Tang. It says, hey, nice videos out there. Thank you very much, Quang. He said, he's just bought a bike, it's a Rally Ram 2.0, bought a second hand, full suspension bike, Front of it, the front shocks don't have any problems. The rear one, a bit of a problem. It's got a 200mm shock, but then the frame can take a 180mm. His question is, should I change the rear shock or not? And if he doesn't, what will it, what would the effects be? Well, if you change it from a 200 to 180, you're going to lower your bottom bracket. So if you're going to 180, you're going to lower that bottom bracket to the ground a lot. But if it's saying that it can take a 180 and you've got some problems with that 200mm rear shock and you need to replace it, Maybe go to your local bike shop, see that if a 180 would suffice. If not, maybe stick with 200, but just get a, a decent shot. Graham Howland's got a question. He says he currently has a 2013 Diamondback Peak 650B. He's done a few mods to it already, but he's asking, can he? should he go one by with a dropper or spend his money buying a different frame set? with a slacker head angle, because at the moment he's got a 68 degree head angle, you might want to go a bit slacker. Well, to be honest, out of everything, to make that bike even better, there's one mod that you should do, and that's definitely spend your money on a dropper, because that is going to revolutionize your bike instantly. One by, I'll wait till, to save you money, I would wait till your two by or your drivetrain that you got on your bike to wear out, then think about upgrading your one to one by. But if you want to get a slightly slacker head angle, maybe buy a slightly bigger tire for the front. That'll just bring up that front a little bit, slacken that head angle as well. That means you can have a, a spare tire for the rear. Move that front one to the rear. coldy has got a question for us. He says, hey guys. Hey. He says, I'm 16 years old. I'm 32. Uh, he did his first XC race last weekend. Pretty good result. He came in the third place. Third race, I mean first race, comes in third on the podium, took him one hour, 47 minutes, 50 Ks, it's quite long, it's like 30 miles, Whew, that's a big one. Says he's got a lot of team, he's, he's had a lot of teams have given him, so asking to give him a bit of support, but he's saying, he feels like this is gonna take a lot of the fun out of it. Well, to be honest, right at the beginning, this is your first XC race, why would you wanna have all that pressure that you probably haven't dealt before in racing? That means you're gonna to have to go and do third, second, or first place in the next race. It's gonna take out a lot of fun. So I would leave that a bit. At least you got some attention. Now you know you're, you're pretty good at it. So leave that. Concentrate on having a bit more fun, gain a lot more experience, get a few more good results, then those deals will be coming in a bit more. But if you wanna know what it's like to become a pro and the life of a pro, take a look at this. But if you're not really into the uh, 
contests and you can become a media writer nowadays and you can do a lot of good videos. You can go photo shoots and promote the bike brands or the products that you're riding, clothing brands that you're riding for through other means of social media, for example. Your Instagram is pretty good. Showing off that you're riding other spots, you're showing off the products you're riding, everything. It's, it's pretty, pretty deep. You gotta sell stuff. It's, you, I could go forever on it, but yeah. It's hard work sometimes, thinking about it, actually. Go, who's that guy? But there's a lot that goes into being a pro behind the scenes that other people don't really get to see. Right, next question coming in from Flying Dynamic 2 he says, I would like to buy an enduro bike. Please go and do it, get your wallet up because it's a pretty good bike to buy. But he has a bit of a dilemma. Which is the best ra enduro racing machine, the Canyon Strive CF8 or the YT Capra Pro or the Race Pro or the Trek Slash 9.7 or the 9.8? Well, I asked Doddy this question, he was like, well, I'm a 29er guy, so he'd probably go for the Capra or the Trek. For me, I have the Strive and I love my Strive. It is pretty good and it is a race machine. The dudes of Hazard use this machine as well for their weapon of choice. I like it, but it's all down to personal preference. Which one do you like? The look of, which one? Take them all for a test. If you've got a demo day near you, go and try one of these before you buy it. Next question. Right, Deer in the Black's got a question and it's all relating to my Scout, my nuke-proof Scout. Um, he's asking what size my bike is and how tall am I? Well, I am five foot eight and I'm riding a medium bike. I like to throw this bike around a lot more. I like to do some tricks. He's saying the medium goes up to a 5'11". Uh, the large goat starts from 5'11 and goes up. He's 5'11, so he's wondering medium or large? But he wants to learn, he's saying he wants to learn bunny hops and other basics. Um, well, it depends if you want to have a really long bike, a bit more stable out there on the trail, or if you want to have a short bike, a lot more maneuverability, a lot more aggressive to be throwing that bike around. You're 5'11, well, that's a tough question. For me, I would go for for the long, just, I'd go large. I'd go for a large, for sure. Hey, deer in the back, if you wanna know how hard you can push this hardtail, take a look at this video. Today is one of those days where I'm gonna tick off all the things that this beast is capable of. So let's kick it off. Pretty rad video on how hard you can actually push a hardtail. They're pretty versatile. I love my new proof scout. Let me know in the, down in the comments below uh, suggestions on uh, part two of that because I want to go and do another one. Right, moving on to correct me if I'm wrong. This one's been sent in to me on Instagram of Bill Farrington42. Uh, <laughs> take a look at that. Oh wow, it crashed on the fire road. I can see his problem. He's actually got the speed but he didn't actually lift that rear tire up to clear that little step to completely land. It's basically he's doing a pre-hop slash jump over a slight drop and landing on the drop. You just want to lift up that front, that rear tire to clear that, but you had the technique. You just got to lift that back wheel up a little bit more. A little bit faster, you'll be landing on that, on that fire road flat and that'd be uncomfortable. So hopefully I've answered your question. Lift up that back wheel. Obviously. Thank you so much for sending in some questions for us to answer on Ask GMBN. We do it every Thursday. If you want to send some questions, please send it to ask at gmbn.com. Likewise, give us some answer questions in the uh, comments down below. Smash the like button if we answered these questions for you. And. Mm. <laughs> if you want to see another rad video and keep watching GMBN, because why not? hit this little video right here and we'll see you at the next one.